Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to our webinar. Um, my name is Nicola. I'm going to be your co-host today with Anna Matias, with who is my colleague at Siena, the NGO promoting this event. And with us, we have Marisa Vedor, PhD, uh, researcher at the Research Center in Biodiversity and Genetic Resources of the University of Porto. Thank you very much, Marisa, again, for accepting our invitation. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> No, thank you. And thank you to all the, to all the participants who, who registered to be with us today. We have over 100 uh, registrations, which, has, which not only makes us very happy and makes, makes this organization worthwhile, but also displays the importance of this subject, uh, particularly about uh, migration patterns of, of sharks, but also uh, human effects on, this, uh, on these species. So it's definitely going to be a very interesting conversation. A quick word about the format. So we're going to have a presentation by Marisa, followed by an open discussion. Uh, we invite all participants to leave any questions or comments uh, in the Q&A box, which we, you will see on the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can you can write um, what you feel like during the presentation itself or after that. Okay, so feel free to write even while Marisa is presenting. And we'll, uh, Anna and I will uh, make your questions to Marisa after the presentation. Uh, for your information, this um, webinar is being uh, recorded and we'll make it available on YouTube uh, in, a, in a short while. So if you feel like it, you can obviously uh, share it with colleagues or friends that you think might have interest. Uh, and I think that's it on our part. Anna, anything that I might have forgotten? No, I think you covered it all. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Marisa, you have the floor. I'm just enabling you to share your screen, and that should be okay. fine now. So please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Can you see the screen being split now? Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, all good. Uh, I mean, uh, you need to put it on presentation mode. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's not I'll, on presentation mode. Okay. I'll read. Our, yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. When we test this morning, it worked really, really well. Yeah. It always happens this way, isn't it? Murphy's yeah. law. <laughs> <laughs> or Windows. <laughs> Windows just playing tricks on us. So let me try again. And now? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, perfect, yeah. Brilliant. So uh, once again, I would like to thank you for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I'll be representing the work the group has been doing for the past years. Uh, I would like to thank also to everyone that are, are on the other side. And I've seen that there are people from everywhere in the world. So that's the brilliance of having uh, of having these webinars that we can reach so many people from so far away in uh, in just a short period of time so today i'll be focusing mostly on blue and mica sharks which are two species of high commercial value a risk from fishing overall shark populations have be, have declined by 70 percent on the past 50 years Pelagic sharks, such as blue and mako, have been highly exploited by longline fisheries, which have been increasing due to the high market value of the shark fin, of the shark fin trade. So longline fisheries, as the name suggests, are composed by a main long line that extends for hundreds of kilometers in the ocean, and along it there are thousands of hooks that uh, catch um, uh, that, that are deployed within the first few hundred meters of that. And these hooks initially were targeting swordfish and tuna, but with increasing demands for sharks, these became now target species. So this leads to the first study that I'm talking this, in this webinar that was led by Nuno Queiroz and David Sims, where we assessed the fishing risk of sharks at a global scale. And for that to be possible, we joined 250 scientists from 100 different institutions to collect data for 23 shark species. 
And here was born the Global Shark Movement Consortium. And to study the behavior of sharks, we used mainly two different types of transmitters, the PSATs and ARGUS. PSATs are tags that record pressure, temperature, and light level, from which it is possible to reconstruct the shark track. On the other hand, ARGUS tags do not provide vertical data, but instead they give high quality positioning by transmitting the shark locations whenever the fin breaks the surface. So the combination of these two transmitters as well allows us to have the both horizontal and vertical data to describe best the shark behavior. So here we can see a video from two different angles of the same, uh, of the same procedure of uh, Gonzalo attaching an Argus tag to the first dolphin of the shark. The shark is brought alongside the vessel and then is uh, is released freely. And whenever the shark, uh, the fin breaches the surface, it will transmit the shark position by uh, either satellite. And it's always a success when, <laughs> when a shark is released. Uh, here, we can see Gonzalo attaching a PSAT tag. These tags uh, are also attached to the first dorsal fin of the shark, but these go through a loop that allows the tag to detach after the defined period of time. And after that, the tag comes to the surface and transmits the data that has been recorded while it was deployed with, on the shark. And in this case, we're, we're seeing a blue shark it was a bit of a struggle to release it, but it's one shark that avoided the fishing mortality. So it is thus possible to observe the movements of 23 different species of sharks throughout the globe. And here we can notice the extensive movements these species go through, crossing many legislative borders and international open waters, which often pose an, pose a, poses a challenge for conservation management. And however, despite being widely distributed, as you can observe on the figure on the left, you can, um, you can see on the figure on the right that sharks tend to aggregate in specific areas, which we call hotspots. Um, and these hotspots are generally associated with very productive waters, such as frontal regions, for example. And yet, also fishing vessels, despite being widely distributed globally, they also tend to aggregate on the same special areas as sharks, following the same environmental cues. And this leads to a high fishing risk, where in this figure we can observe the coincident areas between tracked sh sharks and fishing vessels. So this leads that globally, sharks have a mean monthly overlap of 24%, and this increases to 80% when we are looking at commercial species. So looking now in particular to the blue and mako shark in the North Atlantic, which is the region where they are most intensively fished, we can see that this species, together with the poor beagle, are the ones that have a higher risk from fishing. So besides that, we can also see that uh, this risk varies seasonally, both for blue and mako sharks in this example. So this study provided novel spatial and temporal data on shark and fishing risk, which are very important to define priority areas for conservation and also to have a dynamic near real time data that can be used for management. And this study then contributed to the listing of mako sharks in CITES Appendix 2. And CITES uh, pressures decision makers to implement strong management measures. But despite mekos have been widely overfished, very little is known about their reproductive movements. So this study led by Nun Queiroz and Gonzalo Mucientes identified a putative nursery area in the Pacific. In the Southeast Pacific Ocean, 1,500 mekos sharks were caught in several long lining fishy trips in a nearly of uh, 2,000 holes, which are here represented in gray. 
uh, of these holes, some of those were females, which are here represented in, in triangles. And this data is usually very rare to obtain, as most individual scouts are generally sub-adults, leaving to a knowledge gap for this key life stage. And additionally, Gonzalez saw that there was a longitudinal gradient in size, with larger individuals being found in the West Open Ocean and newborn in eastern coastal waters. This suggests that the Pacific coast of South America is possibly a nursery area. However, it is also in this area where fishing effort is higher. By fishing in nursery areas, juveniles have an increasing vulnerability to fishing mortality that could lead to population declines. And these initial works then led to a recently funded project by FCT and Save Our Seas Foundation, which is Future for our Makos. Here we focus on tracking juveniles and mate in mature female mako sharks in the South Atlantic. On the past few years, we have been observing an increasing fishing pressure in the South Atlantic. It is believed that with the increasing restrictions being imposed in the North Atlantic, it has become now more profitable for fishers to explore new areas. So in similarity to what was observed for the Southeast Pacific, near the area of Santa Elena in the South Atlantic, we found large, pre large pregnant female sharks um, caught by long line fishing vessels. And uh, we also observed some newborns being finned. And despite the high fishing pressure and the suggestion that the South Atlantic may be an important area for the species reproduction, we have no tracking data available for the ocean basin. So this project aims to track both juvenile and large female sharks to identify hotspots and areas of high fishing risk and to study how these life stages will respond to future climate change. Besides these challenges that I mentioned up till now, Mako sharks may also be a risk from climate change. Because the South Atlantic holds a strong oxygen minimum zone that is expanding due to ocean warming and deoxygenation, which is the loss of oxygen in the ocean. And this may affect the shark behavior and distribution. So now I'll go into more details about uh, the sharks and oxygen minimum zones. This study was recently published showing how oxygen minimum zones alter the behavior and fishing risk of blue sharks. Oxygen minimum zones are oceanic features found on the eastern side of the world's oceans associated with upwelling areas. Here, high productivity and poor circulation lead to the high accumulation of biomass that consumes the available oxygen, creating a mid-water layer of water spurring oxygen between 100 and 800 meters depth. As referred before, these areas have been expanding both horizontally, but also vertically and, uh, um, uh, during the past 50 years. And in the future, this trend is, is expected to continue expanding with climate change. However, very little is known about how sharks will respond to these environmental conditions. So for that, we looked at the behavior of 55 blue sharks tagged with both Argus and PSAT tags in this tropical Atlantic oxygen minimum zone here in the area of Cape Verde. And we saw that sharks had a higher permanence within this area than what would be expected by a random movement, which means that sharks showed a preference for surface waters above the oxygen minimum zone. So when we look at sharks' vertical movement, we see that there is a vertical compression of the maximum depth once the sharks encounter the oxygen minimum zone. Well, outside, blue sharks can dive up to 1,700 meters depth. But once they are inside in waters with poor oxygen, this maximum depth is mostly restricted to the upper 500 meters. And although there are some occasional deeper dives within this area, these are much less frequent than in normal oxygenated waters. And this is particularly relevant since as we can see here, that there is a higher fishing intensity in areas inside the oxygen minimum zone rather than outside, which means that fishers can also find target species with less effort. 
So as hooks are targeting the first few hundreds of meters of the water column, and sharks are more compressed to these layers in the oxygen minimum zone, we have estimated that the risk of encountering a hook doubles within this area. So if in the future sharks are being further compressed to the upper layers, their risk may increase both by habitat loss, but also to the risks for, uh, of fishing, of being fished. So then we investigated the responses of mako sharks to the oxygen minimum zone. And it's, it is particularly interesting to compare these two species because despite both being oceanic, pelagic, living and uh, having the same habitat, the same environment, they have two different metabolic strategies that may affect their response to low oxygen. While mako sharks have a bulky body, are endothermic and are one of the fastest swimmers in the ocean, blue sharks, on the other hand, have a more elevated body and are ectothermic. This means that it would be expectable for mako sharks to have higher energetic requirements than blue sharks, which could also be reflected in their behavior in waters poorly oxygenated. So as seen for blue sharks, mako sharks also show the vertical compression while inside the oxygen minimum zone. However, this was even more striking for sharks outside the oxygen minimum zone, as individuals can dive up to 60 times below 1,000 meters depth. However, once they are inside the oxygen minimum zone, they were not observed diving deeper than 500 meters, and 90% of that time was spent within the upper 250 meters depth. So, when we model the vertical habitat of blue and mako sharks, we can see that both have a compression into surface waters in the area of oxygen minimum zone. Uh, but this will be even more striking in the future as the oxygen minimum zone is expanding. However, mako sharks show an even stronger habitat compression than blue sharks, which put together with fishing effort in the area indicates that Mako will be an even higher fishing risk than blue sharks in the future. However, so far we have limited methods to test how these differences in behavior and how of habitat use are reflected into the animal performance. Thus, Ivo da Costa is focusing to address these questions in blue sharks. As so far, it was not possible to calculate the shark energetic expenditure and to describe fine scale behavior in response to the actual oxygen the shark was experiencing in the wild. So in collaboration with the startup Electric Blue, we developed the Trident specs that are shown here in this, in this photo. This couples several sensors that provide vertical behavior and specifically a dissolved oxygen sensor for in situ measurements. Additionally, the accelerometer enables us to distinguish shark fine scale behavior. So here we can see Evil attaching the, the, um, the trident tags to the dorsal fin of the shark, of a blue shark in the Azores, which is a known hotspot for blue sharks. They are just there very close to the boat. <laughs> And, uh, and in this video, you, we, can see, we can see the shark being released uh, after the tagging procedure. So this tag, after being deployed in the shark, it pops up after a program period. Um, and, uh, and once it breaches the surface, it starts giving a GPS signal. So then it is possible to recover the huge amount of data that has been recorded while it was attached to the shark. So then, once recovering the tag, it is possible to obtain depth, temperature, and oxygen information for every second uh, to couple behavior of the shark with the environments encountered. So here we can observe that each variable that was obtained from the tag, which is depth, temperature, and oxygen, and here on the right, we can see how the shark is responding to that environment um, and also see the oxygen and the temperature profiles in the water column. 
So additionally, with these tags, it's also possible to observe fine detail movements of blue shark. So for instance, if we look closely into the single dive, we can see that activity is lower when the shark is diving, but it steadily increases with shoaling. And this is driven by the negative buoyancy of sharks that naturally sink, but they need to actively swim to come back to the surface. So this is important to address the energetic expenditure of diving, particularly for adverse conditions such as poorly oxygenated waters in oxygen minimum zones. And as this is a very recent study, we're really looking forward to for the next developments um, to show us what's, what else is happening to, to, to the sharks here. So to wrap up, the question now is what can be done? Conservation measures could pass by creating marine protective areas in shark hotspots, in nursery areas, and in oxygen minimum zones, which are areas where sharks are most at risk from fishing and from climate change. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen now. Thank you very much for that. Very enlightening and a lot to, to unwrap. Um, I'll remind, uh, I'll remind our participants that you can drop any questions or comments you may have on the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. And uh, before we get into the, the questions we have, I'll maybe start um, with, a, with a quick question, because in the beginning of your, of your presentation, seeing that one of the major drivers for, for shark, uh, the shark threat is, is demand for uh, for consumption. You mentioned at first that uh, the demand for sharks has increased. Um, is your assessment that this is made is in, in the majority, majority because of the increase that we know about for shark fin soup and all that, or is there also an increase for the shark meat itself, regardless of the shark fin soup? Uh, the, the meat itself can be is sold mostly in southern European countries. Portugal mm -hmm. and Spain are big consumers, but they are not targeting the sharks for their meat itself, but mostly for their fins. So the big money comes from the finning. Yeah. Uh, Anna, do you want to start with the Q&A box? Yes, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, but I, I my connection was not good, so I, I missed like three minutes of what you said i'm sorry so i apologize if i if i repeat something but yes we we encourage everyone to to leave their their questions on the q a for for to start and we have someone with 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 the hand raised i would ask him to uh, leave his question or comment in the um, in the um, in, in the Q and A box as well. So uh, we have a question from uh, Katarina, a real hi Katarina, and she says, "Good afternoon. I would like to congratulate both Sienna and Marisa on this webinar. Thank you. Uh, my my question is where there there are sorry, my question is where there are no, I'm sorry, <laughs> there are any seasonal patterns observed for the pregnant female makos." on the Southern Atlantic. Could the females have been caught mid-migration? Thank you. Um, that is difficult to know at this point with that amount of data. So that's the, that's the kind of questions we would like to answer with this new project that it will be starting in September this year. So by the end of the year, we hope to have some, some females already tagged. And in about two years time, I'll be able to answer that question. <laughs> because uh, okay. the idea is to, is, to, is to track them with long lasting satellite tags, uh, Argus tags. Uh, and then we can distinguish uh, m uh, migration patterns and know exactly a, a, a which stage of their movement we're looking at. At this point, it's not possible to say that. Yeah. We can yes. schedule a webinar Sars. in two years' time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks, Thank Marisa. Just a quick, a quick note. I see there's someone uh, that flagged their hand up on the on the, the participants list. We're not going to be activating microphones just to make sure that we can go to as many questions as possible. So if uh, the person who has the hand up can write the question, even in Portuguese, that's fine. We can then translate the question. All right. Thank you. Uh, so there's a couple of. Um, 
notes of congratulations. So I'll just go through them quickly. So Ashley says amazing words, Marisa, thank you. And Luana Coelho, such an amazing work and talk. Congrats, Marisa. So there you are, job well done. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Very supportive. Uh, and then uh, a question from Anne Rix. Thank you, Anna, um, who says, thank you, Marisa. Is there any evidence of blue sharks and mako nurseries in the Zorian waters? Well, uh, there, there has been discussed suggestions uh, that it may be a nursery for blue sharks, but about mako sharks is really difficult to tell at, the, at this point. No one really knows much about mako sharks. Only a couple of weeks ago, there was a study that was um, observing really large females uh, in the West Atlantic, in the West Atlantic, in the area of the, the Gulf Stream uh, of mako sharks, uh, that they think they may be pregnant females, but they don't really know if uh, where they are popping or where the juveniles are. Uh, so that's the whole that's the whole novelty of this project that we want to do is try to bridge the gap on those really striking questions that are important uh it's an important species uh that has been uh so much fished uh the mortality at sea is still pretty high and we know nothing about their reproduction at all. We don't know where the juveniles are. We don't know where the females are. We don't know this, the, the, this key, these key life stages. We don't know where they are and the risk they have been subjected to. But for blue sharks, the information is a bit better. So uh, yes, it is uh, suggestive that uh, the Azores may be a nursery area, that uh, the, the, the area of Portugal and Spain, the coast of Portugal and Spain may be a nursery area. Uh, they have been observing quite a lot of uh, small blue sharks in, in Galicia on the past few years. And mostly now with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the confinement, the sharks are approaching a bit more the coast and they have been become more, uh, uh, more easily observed. So they don't really know if it's an effect of the sharks being closer to the coast or if it's just that people uh, are or, or better. Let me explain that. They don't know if the numbers are increasing or it's just that because there are no people affecting their behavior, it's easier to find them. So that, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, our next question comes from Rafael. He's, from, he's, he's a master student and he's asking, is there robust research on the stress of capturing and tagging sharks? What's your personal opinion on it? Personal. <laughs> If, if there is robust uh, research on tagging sharks. On the stress of capturing and targeting sharks, the stress mainly. Ah, I understand. on the stress of capturing sharks. Yes, certainly, certainly. There are a lot of works um, talking about the, the capture stress of, of sharks. Um, I couldn't name them all to you right now, but there is a lot of literature on that. Yes, definitely. And in fact, one of the one of the things. May I share my screen again? Yes, sure. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. So, one of the things that uh, I, I'm just going to make sure that I'm sharing the right thing. One of the things that Evil noticed was that I'm trying to here here that every single shark he tagged with his fine scale tags, uh, they show this first deep dive and then they do their normal behavior. What we know that is normal behavior. So this first deep dive, it may be a response or almost certainly is a response to capture. So this, this kind of behavior is very well studied already and uh, is very well described. Uh, Marisa, be before you stop the sharing your screen, I might yeah. add uh, a personal question. Uh, if you can go to the slide where you have the, um, the seasonality of bycatch. Seasonality. Just because obviously when we're trying to... Uh, yeah, yes. 
no? yes yes um so as you said portugal and spain are some of the the main consumers in, in the south mediterranean and obviously one of the main uh, fishing fleets that that capture them as bycatch uh so looking at that data could spatial uh temporal i mean temporal closers uh, for certain fisheries be an effective tool to minimize bycatch Precisely, precisely. And this is one of the key things of this study was that sh was showing that not only is important to know where the sharks and the fishers are, so those are the areas to prioritize, uh, but also to know the seasonal, the seasonal uh, uh, risk that varies. So, for instance, if we're trying to protect a, a blue shark during the winter month, maybe it's not so worth it because uh, because the risk there is quite low yeah so if we were to close the hot spot so the area where sharks spend most time it would be better to do it during the summer month when they are more at risk mm -hmm. so this is very very important for management and this is the kind of data that is important for 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 managers to 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 have to incorporate into their stock assessment models or into their managing models uh, to to know not only which are the areas to prioritize but also the seasons. So maybe doing the whole North Atlantic, the whole year round, it, it's no it's not it's not something that they can do straight away. But if you say, look, if you protect the frontal region during the summer month maybe they will be more open to it and, and it will be better for everyone for for people for, due to the social economical issues of fisheries but also for the sharks because we are protecting them when they are more at risk perfect very interesting uh you can maybe stop sharing your screen for the next couple of questions i think will be fine sure. um anna do you want to go to the next one sure sure um so Ines uh, is, is, is the next person that, that has a question for us and uh, she asks a more technical question about the uh, Trident tags. Um, she, she's asking what was the longest period that the tag remained attached? Uh, two days, two days. And this is not a technical question. Uh, the tag can last for much longer. It's really a behavioral uh, reason. So sharks can go for, 50 kilometers a day <laughs> or even, uh, and sometimes even more. So uh, these tags, they record a lot of data. So you have uh, oxygen, temperature and pressure data every second and the accelerometer data for every uh, to the frequency of 30 hertz. So it's milliseconds. And, um, and they need to be recovered for you to obtain that data because it's impossible to send it through satellite. It's just too heavy. So if you're tagging a shark and you're leaving it for one month, you're going to have to recover that tag in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and uh, so it's it, it, for now, we are on the first year of this uh, second year, actually. The time passes. Um, on the second year of this work. And... Uh, and uh, we're doing trials with two days and uh, the sharks have been always around in the area of the Azores. So all the tags were recovered and it was brilliant. So maybe now the next trials we'll try it with a little longer, but I don't know how further we can push it before uh, we lose a shark. <laughs> that they, they just go so far that it's impossible to catch the tag. So this is the reason why. Yeah. Perfect. We'll go through the next question because we have quite a few. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating and keep them coming. Uh, next question is from, I hope I'm saying this right, Steve Gerber. Uh, so he says, hi, great talk. I was wondering how much of the shark hotspots is in EEZ and how much in international waters? Establishing an MPA in either ha has its own challenges. So do you have an idea yeah. of like the shark hotspots there? Uh, the relative presence in EZ and international waters. Yes, we we did do that study. I'm trying to recall the percentages, but um, most of the hotspots at risk were actually in areas outside the EZ. 
because here we're talking about pelagic sharks. So the EZs, of course, they have some impact, but uh, most of the fisheries uh, and the highest risk occurs in open waters, international waters. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Anna, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so next, qu next question uh, is from Colin, and he's asking: Have you deployed oxygen sensors on any species other than blue sharks? What differences would you expect to see in macro movements relative to oxygen? Uh, we haven't yet, but that would be the next step to deploy on uh, macro sharks as well. So then we can compare that study that I showed you earlier uh, to compare the, the vertical movements of blue and micro sharks, but then with the actual oxygen on the on the spot. So the, the study that I showed you was using uh, model data uh, from uh, from environmental uh, servers and environmental products. Uh, they have some error associated, so it wouldn't be too far from reality. So. Answering the question, how would I expect macro sharks to be responding to oxygen would still be that macro sharks are being compressed to the upper layers of the oxygen minimum zone. Now, the question with this new uh, text to be answered was the energetic expenditure of it. And um, from preliminary studies that uh, are not yet published, what we could see was that both blue and micro sharks had a higher DNA damage when they were inside the oxygen minimum zone, which meant that they had some increased stress when they were in areas with low oxygen. But this was slightly less relevant for micro sharks, and that may be driven by two factors. One is that it doesn't dive as deep as blue sharks, so probably is not, um, let's do, put it like that. If you put a bag on your, on your head, you can't breathe. Uh, if it's for two minutes, you take it off, you breathe and you're fine. If it's for five minutes, uh, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> no one can sustain five minutes. If it's for five minutes, then you'll be really stressed, right? So the, this could be what is happening with blue and micro sharks. The micro sharks are not diving into the core of the oxygen minimum zone. So they don't get so much stressed. But on the other hand, it can also be that because they have high energetic requirements, uh, evolutionary, they have enzymes that protect them from getting this damage. So they may be stressed, but they have like a shield that protects, that protects their physiology from being damaged. Uh, and this is the kind of questions that we want to be answering in the future uh, with, the, with molecular data, but also with these tags where we can actually see the energetic expenditure of the shark on that spot. And we can see whether sharks are reducing their expenditure to avoid being hurt, or if they still have a higher energetic expenditure and then it means that they have the shield. Perfect. Thank you, Marisa. We're going to keep going and uh, test your stamina because we have still quite a, uh, quite a few questions. But I they're have all... water. <laughs> I don't okay, have perfect. coffee, but I have water. So, so far, it's good. <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so next question is from uh, Grant Gallen. Thank you very much, Grant, for your question. Uh, so he says, great talk, an amazing shirt. Uh, Marisa, I must say your shirt is making quite a fuss. We've had some personal messages about it. So. My mug. <laughs> and your mug. So the, the, full, the full picture is very interesting for our participants. Uh, it's quite clear. So he says, uh, great talk, an amazing shirt. Uh, your work is going to have important implications for management, especially as we seek ways to reduce macro mortality in the North Atlantic. Hotspots, uh, particularly juveniles and adult females, are going to be an important part of the of management plan. How soon will you be able to present results to the ICAT Shark Working Group? So quite a practical question. As, a, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, that would be really cool to have in two, three years time. So that's the length of the initial project. But so far, until there are solid data and, uh, and we can 
obviously uh, communicates with ICAD, uh, probably within three, four years. But science, science takes its time. <laughs> of course, yeah. And we especially know that for man management purposes, science needs to be as airtight as possible. So obviously, uh, good data takes its time. So yeah, thanks you thank you for the for your answer. Yeah, so the next question is from Lunor. I think I'm I'm reading this right, Lunor Page. Um, she had she had a question regarding marine protect, protected areas because she assumed it would be uh, the best final resu result of such study. So, are you looking into implementing MPA alone in migration hotspots, or do you think MPA networks could be a better option? Well, first of all, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, but first of all, I would like to 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 say that we we're, we're not implementing anything. We are just showing what the data suggests and what and suggesting what what we can interpret from the data. So it, it's not up to us to define where MPAs would be. But I think the network of main PAs would make all sense because you, 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 if, you, if you look at, 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 at the risk maps, mostly in the North Atlantic, you would put a closure in the whole North Atlantic uh, because it, it's very intensively fished. So um, it, would make, it would make sense to, to actually have a network of MPAs and sharks can find the refuge on those spots instead of uh, having one huge one, which we know that is not manageable. And even if they do it, then it wouldn't be real because no one could actually check if, uh, if it was being correctly implemented or not. Uh, so it would be better to, to look at the actual hotspots and the temporal proper closures, and then the sharks can find a refuge in those. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so next question, again, from Katarina Abril. Thank you, Katarina. Um, so she asks, are the new restrictions concerning Mako landings in Portugal enough to stop Portuguese fisheries of these species? Or could this new shift of fisheries from the North Atlantic to the South Atlantic pose a challenge for these measurements? Or for these that's, measures, I guess. That's it's a very good question. That's a very good question. Because while it can reduce the, the the targeting of these species. Most of the times, uh, mako sharks are caught from uh, fisheries targeting blue sharks. So mortality at sea for mako sharks is still of 30%, which is really high. The, to give you some context, since we have people from all backgrounds here, uh, the, um, the mako shark population is uh, is overfished and if uh, we were not to fish anything at all it would take 15 years for the population to stop declining and another 10 years for it to start recovering so it's really bad the situation so just not being able to land mako sharks is already a good step a really good step but uh, it will not prevent the mortality at sea. And this is something that is very striking when we mention the marine protected areas in the hotspots. Because if you are protecting a hotspot, then you would be protecting those 30% of mortality of sharks that are there. And you can see that a hotspot of a blue shark and a hotspot of mako shark are very much coincident. So by protecting those, you would be actually protecting that mortality. And the second question is going up to the South Atlantic. And this is a very real thing. So it's, the South Atlantic was not very explored. Well, well it was explored, but it's, it's becoming very, very uh, intensively fished now. And regulations there are just non-existent. And if it takes so long, as we are seeing for the, Mako, uh, for the North Atlantic to have restrictions, imagine how long it will take to implement those restrictions to the South Atlantic. Meanwhile, the whole thing uh, uh, could be already. Uh, so while we were seeing these huge females there, these huge pregnant females, we don't know for how long they will be lasting. 
So we need to act now. And this, this project is very urgent now because we don't know if in two or three years time we'll still be finding these big females there because we're not finding them in the North Atlantic anymore. Not, not on the East at least. Yeah, very interesting. And by the way, on this topic, uh, is it known like how fluid uh, the connection is between the North and South Atlantic regarding Mekos, for example? Is it two separate stocks or can you consider that it's one big stock? Mm, there is no evidence that there are separate stocks. And we, uh, uh, Gonzalo, Gonzalo's work was, um, I didn't show it here. Uh, he did a work on uh, transatlantic migrations that were both longitudinal, but also north and south. So they, there is the suggestion that they can migrate uh, south. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the next question, I'm going to divide it into, into two because it's, it's, it's quite long and, and we still have time. So first of all, thank you very much, Marisa, and thank you, Sienna, for this amazing talk. Um, I would like to ask, uh, what do you think? What do you think about the ban of shark in fin trade in the EU? Can this represent the turning point on shark fishing and obviously on illegal finning practices? That's the first question. Um, it is a step again, but I think they will always find other ways. But it is definitely a step. Yes, because uh, uh, many fins are exported from Europe to, to East Asia. Uh, so, uh, so Europe cannot comply with this kind of, with this kind of procedures. Okay, and the second question from the same person is concerning management of the shore fin mako populations in the Atlantic. Does the North Atlantic, um, that's pretty much what Nick was asking before, uh, does the North Atlantic population mix with the South Atlantic population? Is there any projection, projections for recover? Um, of, that's of the, the population? Mako. Yeah. Anna. Yeah, yeah, the, the make, I was, I was trying to understand which one was it, um, of the make populations in North and South Atlantic. Do you want to elaborate a bit more on what you said previously, or do you think it's pretty much covered? Yeah, uh, uh, as I said, the, the recover for, for mako sharks, it will be very, very slow. And uh, this is known for the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic uh, shark that in a, that, we're talking about the South Atlantic shark, but as I mentioned earlier, it's probably the all the, the same thing. Uh, there is there is not not enough data. Just there isn't enough data to to say how long it will take to recover the stock. They don't even know for sure if the stock is being overfished or not. Uh, so from the fishing intensity, you would say that probably is, but there is no data there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting to see that some, some different people have the same question about all these uh, migration patterns or possible migration patterns of these species because it's a crucial factor into understanding what can we do to protect them because obviously we need uh, we need that information. So thank you very much, Marisa. Very enlightening so far. Um, Periclis Silva, thank you, Periclis. I, I'm hope I, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, from Imar Institute from Cape Verde. Thank you. Nice to see that we're on. Uh, on the African continent as well. Uh, would you consider Cape Verde a hotspot for Mako shark? And if the area is at risk, sorry, I lost the question. Um, if the area is at ri a risk zone for the species. Thanks for the very nice presentation. So any information on Cape Verde and Mekos? Uh, well, from this, uh, from our tracking data, so that's what we use for, for, for the overlap project. Uh, there is a suggestion that uh, Cape Verde is a hotspot for both blue and mako sharks because they spend there more time than what would be expected if they were just passing by. That's what we mean with a, with a random movement, if they were just going anywhere. No, they actually choose to be on that area. Um, maybe because there is a lot of, a lot of food, a lot of prey. Um, so, and as they are being compressed into the shallow waters, they become even more susceptible to fisheries. So definitely, if uh, there is an area to protect, it would be around Cape Verde. Very interesting. 
Yeah, um, very, very interesting to know. Um, so the next question is from uh, Bruno and he asks, uh, Marisa, do you have any comment on why Mako and Blue Sharks make these rather quick deep dives and quick upward movements many times even during one day? Any comment? Yeah. Uh, so they were initially thought to be mostly epipelagic sharks. And so they do spend a lot of time in the epipelagic as they are visual predators. It's very easy to, to catch the prey there. Uh, but, but a study that will come out eventually sometime, <laughs> very, very soon, hopefully, uh, that we're doing precisely on that, on the deep dives. And uh, what we have seen so far is that they uh, they are possibly diving in areas where the the epipelagic layer, so the upper layer, doesn't have so much food, and they 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 dive to catch prey at depth, but also in areas that are known to aggregate a lot of deep water prey, so deep water cephalopods, uh, deep water fish, and it makes the, the, the dive profitable. So if they cannot catch the, the prey that they want on the surface, they would deep dive to, to find that good prey at depth, and this in a very simplified way. Uh, so these, these deep dives that you observe are mostly associated with foraging. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Marisa. We were uh, deciding on where to end because we've had a lot of questions and you've been amazing answering everything like a, like a machine gun. So thank you very much. We'll probably have uh, two more. Anna, if that's okay, I'll ask uh, the next one. And we have a finishing one that should be uh, quite easy, but an inter interesting way to finish. So another question from uh, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Uh, very important to know that blue shark and mako shark hotspots likely overlap. In the USA, our longline fleets tell us that it's impossible to catch swordfish without catching makos. Uh, in your experience with the Portuguese fleet, do they have that same problem? In other words, would mako closures negatively affect blue shark and swordfish landings? I can repeat slower if you want. No, I'm thinking. Uh... I want to say, I want to say yes, because the question was just posed the other way around that we're used to. So exactly. long liners are fishing swordfish and blue sharks, mostly, and then mako sharks are caught as well, and they have value on that. Okay, so if we do it the other way around, if we are closing the, the hotspots of mako sharks, if the blue shark and the swordfish fish, uh, fisheries will be affected as well, for that spot, yes, but they could also be catching swordfish and blue, blue shark in other places that are not necessarily hotspots of blue shark, of mako sharks, because they, 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 they have a similar, they, they, they may have similar response, but they're not exactly the same. It's not 100% of overlap between the hotspots of of mako sharks and of blue sharks. They, mm -hmm. they, they follow similar cues, but it doesn't need to be necessarily exactly the same. And in fact, when you look at the seasonal risk, you see that mako sharks have a different seasonal risk of blue sharks. So already from that, you can see that it's not, that by protecting all the hotspots of, of, of mako sharks, you're also protecting all the hotspots of blue sharks. Was yeah. that clear? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so at least for me, yes. Because... Also got it. <laughs> yeah. No, but because that's the uh, that's obviously the main uh, the main concern is how to effectively protect in this case makos without it affecting uh, overwhelmingly the swordfish fishery. But that's where your work comes in, comes in handy and where we need it because if uh, if an area is to be closed and say okay we're going to protect sharks fishermen need to know exactly what the data is so then they can know okay we'll stop fishing there for three or four months in the year but that justifies it to protect mako in particular so yeah very interesting um anna do you want to close with the last yeah. questions because after that 
Uh, yeah, we still have um, yeah. six minutes more or less. So um, I I would like to 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 thank you all of you for the amazing questions we had. And if Marisa doesn't oppose, I think we could share her email, her email when we send the recording, uh, because I think there's a lot of people here that would like to engage in further conversations with you. I think yeah, that's sure. the case of Pericus Sil Silva from Cape Verde, I think. Uh, maybe Nick, I will may I will ask this question and then you can finish. Is that okay with you? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Because we yeah. have one other question, uh, like uh, more okay. up, but it's related okay. to what Marisa just talked about. So okay, yeah, okay. So this question from Pericles, Pericles, I'm sorry, it's 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 another technical one, but I think it would be certainly uh, good for you to to uh, to continue this conversation. So. He first thanks you for, for the previous answer. And uh, he's saying that we have one project and we have some P sets tags, the, the ones you mentioned, to use in pelagic predators. And maybe we, sh we would target Mako shark. Any suggest suggestion? This is an open one. Uh, maybe we can, uh, we can then talk in private. So I'll have also Nuno Queiroz, um, which is the leader of the group. And uh, we can discuss uh, project cool. details, and that sounds yeah. really good. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy with this. Good. That's Nick. perfect. And yeah, obviously, well, not obviously because I don't know if you've been keeping up, but you have you have uh, nice words coming from your colleagues Nun Queiroz, Gonzalo Lucientes, and our boss as well in Siena, another Gonzalo, who is thanking you as well for your time. Uh, we have a, another question from Pedro, but I think it's been answered about whether North Atlantic fishing fleet vessels mainly target sharks or other pelagic oceanic species such as swordfish and catch sharks out of bycatch. So I think that that has been explained. It's mainly a, a bycatch issue, but obviously there's there's some some of it going going into the market and now quite a quite a tricky situation with Spain and Portugal forbidding uh, to to land these species and to sell it. Um, so thank you, Peter, for your questions. Anyways, um, and I think I think we're done. <laughs> quite a, quite an intense Q and A, maybe the most yeah. intense one we've had so far. <laughs> people are obviously very keen to to know more about this. Obviously, it's a it's a big issue, and we're we're part of the team of NGOs that are trying to do something about mako shark uh, preservation in the Atlantic. So thank you very much, yeah. Marisa, for your thank time. you for your work, and this is really important to reach the everyone not just to keep it on the scientist and management side but to involve everyone on these issues and uh, and also to see the the work that is been do is is it has been done uh, all over the world with new technologies and also all to 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 actually answer and and, and uh, questions that are still unanswered about sharks, that people assume that everything is already known about sharks, but it's really far from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that's, uncovering that's... the tip of the iceberg, for sure. Yes. <laughs> One of our goals with these webinars is to make make the most out of this situation, the pandemic situation, had to have a lot of people from different different places around the world, which would would be harder for us to have if we if if we had in person events. So this said, this has been a really good learning period for us, and we are very happy with 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 the turnout and with how many questions we had. Um, I think we can close the session now, Noni. Yeah, I agree. Again, thank you very much, Marisa and thank Anna, you. for your help and all the participants. We've had around 60 participants following the webinar. So thank you very much for your uh, for your time. And obviously, keep an, uh, keep an eye on our social media. We have some more webinars to, to fulfill your, your days. So thank you very much for, for joining us and see you next time. Obrigado, Marisa. Até breve. Obrigada. <laughs> thank you. Tchau, tchau.